want to go over some of our heroes here. Please tell me the most important contribution or greatest thing you learned from this person. Pete, most important contribution of Lou Rockwell. Oh, man, that um, the first thing I ever read that he wrote was a he's taking down drunk driving laws. Yeah. And it was just I mean, you can do that on social media now still, and people will threaten your life. I mean, that drives people crazy. But Lou just had this great article about how drunk driving laws are immoral. You're basically, you know penalizing people for you're destroying people's lives for something they might do. And um, I mean, it was just for Lou, just how brave he is. I mean, just how brave he is to talk about stuff that really no one else wants to talk about. (laughs) Sal, most important thing you learned from Lou Rockwell. (sighs) Oh man. Um, His most important contributions, I would say are Lou Rockwell.com. The Mises Institute, <clears throat> which yeah, there's no Mises Institute. Yes. We aren't having this conversation. Um, and he also literally, in the literal sense of the word, he actually wrote the book on capitalism versus fascism. So if you want to find out the, the true, um, a real take on fascism, you're not going to find it from any Antifa sympathizer. You're going to find it from Lou Rockwell. So check that book out. Those are my three favorite contributions. Of course, he was instrumental in building up Ron Paul. I mean, I can go on and on about Lou Rockwell. He's, he's one of those guys where I'm like, I want to have him on the show, but I'm too nervous to actually like invite him on. So I've had him on. I've had him on once. I talk to him every time I go to the Mises Institute and everything. He is literally like um, like the reason I get pissed off when people attack him is like my dad was a real piece of shit. And he he like is so warm to me that he almost feels like a dad. So yeah. like when people attack him, I like lose my mind. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I met him at a, a Mises seminar. He was so, he was so kind to me. Um, I would say uh, one of the most important things I learned was his can anarcho capitalism work? And he says, let's say that we get to a minarchist state. Well, we're going to spend a lot of time and energy explaining to people why the minimum wage is wrong, agricultural subsidies, educational subsidies, fire department, police, and all these other things. Or we could communicate the ideas that we learn in kindergarten, don't hit, don't steal, don't initiate violence. And that seems like a much more secure position than the minarchist one. That was just mind-blowing because we always hear that it's unrealistic, as good as our ideas are. No, you guys are unrealistic. Um Gosh, Pete, most important thing you learned from Samuel Edward Conkin, the third. God. Uh, the list goes on and on. Um, probably a class theory. Uh, I know Wally, nice. Wally really had to draw it out and bring everything together because it was, you know, Sam didn't sit there and really come up with it on his own. So Wally had to really put it together. But really being able to separate the the vulture class from us, from those of us who don't want to have state benefits, don't want to benefit from theft from other people and how that really there's only, you know, where Marx wants to talk about, wants to divide up the, um, the culture into so many different pieces and everything. There's really only two. And that's the, um, the plunderers and the, uh, the plunderers and the plunder plundered. And um, that's, you know, Konkin really did an amazing job with uh, pulling that out and putting that out. Yeah. Sal, most important contribution of SEK3. You know, you're asking me to answer something quickly that I, I need, I've done a whole podcast on. So let me just say, like, class theory obviously is critical. That is, you know, we just we discussed it earlier. Um, counter economics or the structure of revolution. Right. That was key. The application of logic to the social sciences, that was revolutionary. Um, <clears throat> I think in, in, the, in, the, in the big picture, in the grand scheme of things, Konkin's contribution was, and I just have an article out today on New Libertarian about this, um, and I think the sort of contribution that I see in the grand scheme of things is that he's taken classical anarchism in the sort of William Godwin, Proudhon sort of sense, the 19th century communal anarchist, and he's added the element of Rothbardian or Misesian economics. So now you have the 
original anarchism, but it, now it has this element of sound economic and moral theory to it. And he sort of made the whole thing consistent. And he solved a lot of problems that the, that the classical anarchist thinkers had. Um, and he sort of was sort of the amalgamation of all those thinkers from from Godwin up to Walter Block, right? I mean, he, he sort of put all those pieces in, of the puzzle together in a way where it formed one coherent picture. Yeah, I would say uh, definitely an agorist primer, um, how he said a good solid foundation would be for libertarians with our economic theory to go to people who already don't, who already like operating outside of the state, which yeah. includes anyone who is engaged in a garage sale or has paid someone off the books and then just start, you're starting small and then you're extending it. I, I thought uh, that, you that know, uh, was brilliant. I, I'll give you a good example real quick. I'm speaking um, in April to a food church. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about this, but it's, Pete, uh, we had actually the guest on the Unloose the Goose. Um, uh, I, I I don't think you were there. I think it was just me and Nicole. But right. the idea is that uh, she wanted to sell her own beef and her own food, and the USDA was, like, harassing her. So she said, well, this is a church now, all right? And I, I'm a pastor, and I'm handing out sacraments. And they have left her alone since. So I'm going I'm to deliver the same message that you just said, Keith, is that we have people in the, in the counter economy who are unaware of what agorism is. And that's why I want to speak to them. That's why I'm going to go there and try to show them, hey, what you guys are up to, there's a specific philosophy. There's a, there's a term for this. It's called agorism. Here's the book. And I think that sort of outreach is very important. Pete, most important contribution of Scott Horton. Oh, man. Um, I, I mean, you could talk about every piece of foreign policy out there, but really it's to attack the right from the right and the left from the left. I mean, if you go and attack the left in a right wing way, I mean, if you go to the left, if the left is talking about, you know, is like, well, you know, if they're say they're ignoring war somewhere and, you know, you remind them about how it's like, wait a minute, weren't you, aren't you guys anti-war? Weren't you anti-war during the George W. Bush era? Aren't you look at this thing of the sixties it was the left that was anti-war. What are you guys doing? What happened to you? You know, and then the right, you can talk. I mean, God, there's so many ways you can say, oh, you're supposed to be the you're supposed to be the um, party of fiscal responsibility. I mean, how much do you think these wars are costing you? Yeah, I mean, it just you have to know how to talk to people. You, I mean, you basically what he's saying is you have to be able to embarrass people. You yeah. have to be able to be like you, you realize that you say one thing out of one side of your mouth. And what's coming out of the other side of the mouth is a complete opposite. Why don't you get that straight? Why don't you get that go get get that in line? I think that's how Tucker Carlson uh, is so big right now, having the number one show. He was the annoying bow tie guy, and now he is the well respected guy on Fox who's willing to speak out uh, against the wars and for the whistleblowers. Sal, most important contribution of Scott Horton. I can think of another bow tie guy who spoke out about wars and stuff like that that I prefer. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a, I mean, Scott Horton's entire life is a sort of an example of the way libertarians should live, I think. Um, in terms of his most important contributions, the Libertarian Institute does amazing, amazing work. The Scott Horton Show, obviously. Um, also, Scott plays a very important role in the, what Rothbard said was this thing of ours, right? He's sort of like our geopolitical analyst, and I think that's really key because people on the right and the left have geopolitical analysts that they turn to, and we don't, right? We, we all, the only one we have is Scott Horton. So like you read guys like Bob Kaplan, who's sort of like a, the modern-day Henry Kissinger, and like they have these like crazy geopolitical theories that at the end of the day, the bottom line is we have to go to war. Well, Scott is saying no. Look, here's here's geopolitics, but he's drawing the opposite conclusion, right? We don't need to murder people because of these paradigms that exist. But his most important contribution to me is maintaining the principle of, of being anti-war. And um, I think he sort of forced everybody in the entire movement to keep that front and center in their minds. And I think without him, I'm not really sure that that would be the case. I'm sort of worried that in the absence of Scott Horton, you might see people sort of gravitate towards neoconservative and neoliberal foreign policies, which is extremely dangerous. Sure. Yeah, Scott made it cool to be anti-war. His book, Fool's Aaron. Yeah. It's, it's not just 
Here's, uh, you know, th there are some unintended consequences he hits at. It's immoral. Here's how it could have been avoided. Here's what caused it. He makes such an in-depth case in Fool's Errand that when and, I read that book, I was just blown away. And like you were saying earlier, we talked about liking people. Like, he's so relatable. He just, yeah. like, he's like, he just seems like somebody you'd run into, you know what I mean, outside or like hanging out with your friends or something. Pete, most important contribution of Walter Block. God. These are some hard ones, Keith. Yeah, you're killing me here. <laughs> um, well, I mean, he wrote a book about this thick on the thing that we get hit with every <laughs> single day is who will build the roads. And he wrote a book on the privatization of the roads. It's about 500 or 600 pages. And I mean, you don't you don't need to read the whole book. You just skim through it and start reading. And you're like, oh, OK, that's how it could be done. And, you know, I've talked to him. I've had him on the show. And it's like, yeah. So I'm like, so what if a farmer doesn't want you know, to sell you the land? Well, you go under it or you go over it. Or you, and it's just I mean, I mean, who better? What better contribution than that story? stupid question that we hear constantly referred to and he answered it in one book sal most important contribution of walter block again man this is a very difficult question to answer um <clears throat> he has a whole series of books that he's still publishing defending the undefendable we're waiting for number three to come out if you're listening walter please get it out soon i really want to read it um but that to me defending the undefendable is important because it's like I, and I've said this to him, I said, this is like a keystone of, of agorist writing, you know, and, uh, you know, that's really sort of, I, I even have it listed on my website under agorist text, and Walter Block is not an agorist, he's an, he's an ANCAP, but that to me is really proving our case for us. Um, he also has a lecture um, out there called Privatize Everything, which he turned into a series of books which privatized the privatization of roads was the first in that series. But there was also um, Water Capitalism and another book that just came out is a newest book called Space Capitalism, which, you know, I'm a huge space nerd. This was like, you know, libertarian porn for me. So like, you know, all of those books are wonderful. If you want to learn how to water, how to privatize rivers, ponds, roads, m the asteroids, the moon, Mars, things like that. There's no better person for radical anarchist thought um, with the one except one possible caveat of Bob Murphy than Walter Block. Yeah, uh, Walter Block really embraced the Henry Hazlitt idea of economics. It's not about the initial effects on one group. It's about the secondary and tertiary effects on all groups. And he does that in defending the undefendable so well. He says this thing that you just think is a that you're just calling bad. Well, there's actually yeah. secondary benefits from it. And you can benefit from it too if you choose to participate and you bear the cost if they enforce a law like this so how many the, times on the internet or is someone like uh you know you and they level some accusation at me and i'm like all right let me go defending undefendable chapter seven mm -hmm. what does walter block mm -hmm. say here you know so <laughs> I, I remember cracking up when he talks about the case for free speech and how if you were a sadist or a masochist, you could use you could use free. free I can't even say it. All right, Pete. Finally, uh, best contribution of uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe. Being able to, I have, I, I'm going to have an episode coming out later this week on Hoppe, and um, me and Bird are going to, Bird and I are going to do an episode on Hoppe, and we're going to talk a lot about his, how, because he was brought up by a so as a socialist and was under the tutelage of Habermas, how he is probably the premier person alive to destroy socialism because he under no one understands i mean look at look at the book democracy the god that failed i mean it's taken from a book from 1950 that was called the god that failed where all these former communists came came out then you have what must be done 
well, I mean, that's a Lenin book. It was called What Is to Be Done. He's constantly going, he's constantly using a lot of the dialectic that a lot of the Marxists used in argumentation. And I noticed that um, Rothbard did that too. When I started reading Lenin, I was like, wow, a lot of the, a lot of the dialectic is the same here. And I think it's really just his being able to destroy socialism while raising up private property at the same time. And it's just, but also, also being able to say something like Marx got 90% right. Yeah. And being able to defend that. And, you know, he's not, he's not saying, oh, that this was, he's saying it's a terrible idea, but he got it. You know, Marx got a lot of it. It was just, his answers to it were, were bad. And um, I, I think that when I want to, um, when I want to read like a real good critique of socialism and communism, I mean, Hoppe, I, I, pr- I actually prefer Hoppe to Mises. So. Yeah. Uh, Sal, uh, best in, uh, contribution of Hoppe? Um, everything P just mentioned, of course. Um, the private production of defense, I think, is great. He, he, he also, he's got some history in there that I think is really important, but, you know, all that aside, I think that Hop's most important contribution is argumentation ethics. I think it's probably the most important development in the social sciences in the latter half of the 20th century, in my honest opinion. The reason why is because um, it's such a devastating critique against socialism. There's no coming back from it. You just, you, you can't, I mean, and he literally, that's the whole, that's why it's so powerful, is because you can't argue against it in the literal sense of the word. You cannot. Right. And for the audience out there listening, just very briefly in a crude form, Rothbard justified property rights via natural law, whereas Hop came in and said, yeah, that's true. But, you know, we, we talk about homesteading principle and whatnot being justified via, you know, God because it's your God given rights. Well, Hop took it a step further and said, every time you make an argument, you're mixing your resources of your body with, you know, labor, right? Your, your mental labor. So you're mixing your tongue and your vocal cords. You're, you, and just by constructing an argument against the homesteading theory, you're validating it. So to me, and Rothbard even said it made natural law seem like pathetically weak or whatever the exact quote was. I'm not sure. So I, that is, you know, that's huge. It's a logical proof that socialists can't overcome. And uh, I was going to throw this at Ben Burgess. Uh, but one of the things he said to me was, oh, you know, there's no reason why groups or collectives can't homestead a piece of property. And I didn't have, I was running out of time, so I didn't have, have time to go into in methodological individualism. But yeah, to summarize, I think that's his most important contribution is argumentation ethics. I would say the biggest thing I learned was a theory of socialism and capitalism, his ability to come up with consistent definitions. Whereas I would think capitalism is about money. Oh, well, isn't the government uh, about money? And if socialists try to earn money in workers' cooperatives, well, doesn't that count? And it was so difficult. It's like, well, it's about uh, the, the workers owning the means of production. What, entrepreneurs don't work? Business owners don't work? I was going crazy. And then he explains it. Capitalism is a social system based on the explicit recognition of private property and non-aggressive contractual exchanges between private property owners, where socialism is the institutionalized aggression against that. Because even if it's the state owning the means of production, well, what about the big re- redistribution state that isn't owning any factors, but tax rates are 85 percent? Well, what is that, capitalism? Hoppe does that so beautifully. And then you just end. All you have to do is know. And then communism, as Marx defined, is the abolition of private property. So, yeah, Hoppe was uh, was just brilliant. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on. Freeman, beyondthewall.com, saldiagris.com. Thank you for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute.